Move over, Pagan Rome. The International Olympic Committee promotes transgenderism and makes a sport out of men battering women. Move over, idiocracy. Cackling Cami may well be our next president. And finally, the Latin Mass summits Mount Kilimanjaro as American and African clans unite and get ready to reset the Catholic Church. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Michael Matt, and this is The Remnant Underground. So good to be home, back here in the studio after almost three weeks uh, out of the country. Africa, what to say about Africa? I mean, it was, um, I was really surprised. It was stunningly uh, beautiful. But I wanted to thank everybody, first of all, everyone who, um, who supported this, this thing. I know it was kind of crazy. What, what, what are they doing? What are they going to Africa for? What, what, what? First of all, you supported the fundraiser. We raised, I don't even know what the final dollar amount, but it was well over $100,000 for some of the missions down there that are training young people, training young men. You know, just fantastic fundraiser success. But also, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, just try to try to convey what it meant to do this as a team. You know, we really we really were a team. We didn't have very much signal, um, uh, internet signal. So when you're on Kelly, it kind of comes and goes with the wind, kind of. You see one bar and then it disappears, and then two bars. And so I wasn't able to stay in touch. Uh, but when we when I was when I did get messages from back here from the rented offices, it was always about you guys you know, behind it and praying for us and, and all of that as we made this climb. And it was, it really made a huge difference. You gotta remember, this is the highest freestanding mountain in the world. I'm not a mountaineer, you know, so there was a lot of intimidation, a lot of questions, and it really made a big difference to know that you guys were praying for us. And thank you, just thank you so much for that, for creating a really memorable and wonderfully Catholic and unique experience. So I got to serve Father Giles Silvera's Mass every single day, which was a huge honor for me. I, I'm sure I made a lot of mistakes, but it was a, a great honor. Um, and then our chaplain, again, climbed the whole thing. Father Joao called, climbed the whole thing in his cassock all the way to the summit, led us praying the Angelus, praying the Rosary, praying the Latin Mass. It was a thoroughly Catholic climb. It was great. Uh, the last day, the last base camp that you come to, you spend five, six, seven days just trying to acclimate uh, in, in Kilimanjaro, in the area. And then you go to base camp. Uh, you have a little something to eat. We had mass first, then we had a little something to eat. Then you go to bed, and then you get up at 11 o'clock, have a little tea, uh, get ready for a very cold weather climb, and you start at midnight. You start walking up, straight up the summit at midnight, climbing through the night. Uh, and then we arrived at, at the summit, finally, at sunup. And I'm telling you what we saw, what, just from, a, from the point of view of God's creation, the natural beauty, here's what it looked like at 20,000 feet uh, above the clouds. It was absolutely amazing. So thank you. As, as, the, as the air got thinner, the temperatures plummeted. It was really, it was really good. As, as in fact, at one point, when we're about halfway up, about three in the morning, the little tube that goes back to the camel pack froze solid. So now I'm not able to hydrate. I'm thinking, God help me, what's gonna happen up here? But everything worked out just fine. And the really good news for all of us is that in the era of Traditionis Custodis, we did, thanks be to God, we managed to bring the Latin mass to the rooftop of Africa every single day. Our friends, the porters and the guides, they said they had never seen anything quite like this. Some of them, their duty was to carry the altar on their heads and the masket on their heads straight up, you know, to 20,000 feet all the way. And then every day, take it up, take it down, put it up, set it up, set up the altar for mass, traditional Latin mass. Most of them were outdoors. There's only a couple that had to be in a tent uh, because of inclement weather. And so there they are, the porters, folks walking around up there. They see these Catholics, traditional Catholics, kneeling on the rocky grounds, the, the temperature frigid, the winds of Kilimanjaro, famous, blowing against Father. I don't know how he managed to do it. Uh, but every single day then, we had the Latin Mass up there, which is an unbelievable uh, experience. And the porters, the guides, they were so intrigued that lots of them, even though they weren't Catholic, they would sort of gather around the Mass. This is this is the thing when you talk about Traditionalis Custodis and what's happening with Team Francis. You know, this Mass is something so unique so sacred, so holy, that even if you're not Catholic, we saw this every single day, even those who aren't Catholic are somehow drawn to it. What's happening? Because they saw, they know how difficult Killy is. It's really, really tough. And yet at the end of the day, 
here are all these guys, we get together and this priest who wore a cassock, who wore his cassock all the way up to the summit, right? No easy feat, would offer mass. And all these folks would get on the ground and you could just see once again, it's like when, you, when we were in Catholic school, they talk about how the missionaries would, would bring the Latin mass into places that didn't necessarily understand English, understand Latin, but they were intrigued by the sense of the sacred. We actually got to see that in a third world country, in the, in, up, in the, up in, in Kili, almost like a missionary land, you got to see what the Latin mass can do, how it can actually bring people to ask very interesting questions. So that's that what was going on the whole time. So on the last night before we went back down and when I continued our pilgrimage out to look at traditional Latin mass uh, center sent, uh, elsewhere in Tanzania, the porters and the guides, these beautiful people who we'd become such good friends with, they actually, the cook, actually took the time to bake a little cake, a little cake with popcorn around the edges at 19,000 feet. And guess what's written on the cake? cake? The words, Ave Maria, and they presented the cake to us as a sign that they appreciated what, what our mission was. As far as they were concerned, mission had been accomplished. Here they are. And they understood, our guides and porters understood, that we were climbing this for the mother of Christ the King. Somebody else, especially a guy named Christopher Went, had this idea, and it was amazing to see how effective it was, you know? In fact, in fact, in fact, to those of you who say Unite the Clans is a joke, you know, next week we're going to post probably, this. We, we shot this in Tanzania, probably one of the most unusual video interviews that I've ever done. Uh, this is with a gentleman named Kefas, who is a mountain guide from the Maasai tribe. The Maasai tribe, I'm sure you've seen pictures and we'll throw a few up on the thing here. Um, and he, what we discovered, what I discovered in talking to him, is that in his heart, he has the same righteous anger against the global elites that I do thousands and thousands of miles away. You know, in my little, my little Catholic homeschool, we have the exact same attitude to the people who will not leave us alone, who are trying to crush our culture, crush our religion, crush our family, in his case, shrink the families of Africa to non-existence, right? So, so KFOS is gonna be on the show next week, and I can't tell you how interesting it was to discover this. You talk about when you start talking to people um, and you realize how much they're sick and tired of the folks who are trying to wreck the world right now. We're sitting there in a tent on top of Killy, winds blowing, it's dark outside, and he starts talking about what his cultural family traditions are, including very traditional old world things. For example, building a fire in the evening and all of the kids and grandkids sit around and the elders tell stories about what the way things used to be, about the history of their tribe, right? He says his grandfather has a hundred grandchildren, these huge, beautiful African families and the culture that comes with it, all they want is to preserve that and to be left alone. And it was remarkable to listen to this man, this Maasai tribesman, sound exactly like traditional Catholics, you know, living over in, you know, in the middle of Midwest, the United States of America, about the effort that's being made to shut us down. Beautiful things and a hopeful thing in that we again see that this body of resistance is global, it's worldwide, it encompasses people from all different religions, from all different cultural backgrounds. They're all, we are all sick and tired of what's going on. Just yesterday, this man Kefas from the Maasai tribe, he sends me this photo of his beautiful wife and children because we really had struck up a friendship. And he, he includes a little note that, that I'll, I'll put a little bit on the screen. He says, hi, Michael, how are you there? Hope you arrived home safely. It was so nice to meet you and with all the conversations that we had. Let us make the world a better place for all of us by going back to where we began we should surrender ourselves to our lovely God who knows where to take us. Let us go back to a society that values tradition and a culture that contributes to a big percentage by making the world a better place for everyone. You know, and by the way, the Catholic Identity Conference is going to have more of this, this sort of African connection, which is so crucial right now. The, the Catholic Identity Conference sponsoring the show tonight, uh, the live stream. 
That's going to be next month. We're going to unite the clans of a lot of folks, including, once again, Bishop Emmanuel from Nigeria in Africa. So this is going to continue. This is a, this is a big deal, a big movement. I really hope you'll join us by live stream. We're going to have special things set up where I'm going to be emceeing that conference. We'll be talking to each other and we'll be taking your questions and doing whatever we can to sort of interact throughout the three-day weekend. All you got to do is sign up for the CIC live stream today. There's a link right down here. And let's make the Catholic Identity Conference, let's make it the shot that's heard, heard around the world. It's got, it's, it's got a twofold purpose, obviously, to proclaim the social kingship of Jesus Christ and to unite the clans against those who would try to crush the social kingship of Jesus Christ. So go right now, go to catholicidentityconference.org, sign up for that live stream. And again, let's make this a really, really big deal. I can't wait to, to see you there. So I went to Africa, all hell broke loose. Uh, this guy trying to kill Trump, which was, and I wanna talk about that, what's really interesting is that Pope Francis' silence, I don't know if we're gonna have time to get into that tonight, but the fact that he has said not one word about this attempted assassination of, you know, arguably, certainly in terms of Supreme Court justice appointments and so forth, the most pro-life president uh, in, in American history, somebody tries to kill him and the Vatican can't be bothered to even denounce that. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty terrible. I don't, I don't know if we're gonna get into that tonight or not, but it is interesting what Francis decides not to talk about these days. He didn't say a word about the obscenity, the sacrilege at the uh, Olympics opening uh, ceremony either. So, and we will get into that in a bit. So what happened? I mean, I, I just couldn't believe it. I, I, you know, just, just watching this scandal, this international scandal, formerly Catholic France, the eldest daughter of the church, serving up, I mean, just an, an embarrassingly cringeworthy international display of blasphemy and sacrilege at the Olympic Games, you know? And you just gotta ask yourself why? What, who are they trying to appeal to? What's their problem? You know what I mean? Like, I find it actually on some level sort of encouraging because they cannot let it go. You think by now they would be ignoring what's left of Christianity, but they can't. They can't, they're, they're fixated, they're obsessed with it like, a, like the demons that they are. So at any chance they get, they bring it all up again and start making fun of it again. And <laughs> what is wrong with you people, you know? So there is something sort of faith enhancing. They got nothing except mocking us still. That's all they got, you know, these, these enlightened ones. It's just, it's, it's unbelievable. So we got to see that. And then the Olympics themselves. So we got to see, for example, the new Olympic sport. You heard of this one, of course, everybody's talking about it. Men beating the crap out of women. Boxing fans, don't you know what's going on out there in the Olympics? Didn't you just see a man, a weirdo, mm, that's a beat, supposed to be in a straitjacket, beat a woman from pillar to post? Huh? Oh, oh, we numb to it, huh? Y'all ain't gonna speak up. No athletes gonna speak up. Mm? No boxing content creators gonna speak up. Huh? You scared to lose subscribers and views or monetization? Mm? You spineless cowards. Spineless cowards are you. Weak men, what's wrong with you beta males scared to stand up and speak up against this trash? <laughs> you know what, this is, this, is, this is sick and perverse men beating up on women, beating women half to death for fun, for entertainment. This is homose a homosexual aphrodisiac at its very worst. <laughs> you know, and the, and the mob's just looking on, right? Thumbs up, thumbs down. The same way that degenerate pagans at the end of the Roman Empire amused themselves in the Colosseum by watching Christians get torn to pieces by wild animals, right? We're back. It's all happening again, friends. Are you happy? Do you feel enlightened? Is this progress or what? <sighs> what we're looking at is the sadistic hallmark of the last days of any civilization that went to the point of debauchery and godlessness like we're We think we're all enlightened, right? No, my gosh, this has happened so many times. This is the dark ages. This is how it always ended. Oh, but it's the Olympics and I wanna see how many gold medals we get. Really, do, do, do you care? Do, do you really 
care anymore about the bread and circuses that these clowns set up? Aren't we kind of done? You know, we called for a boycott of the NFL a few years ago. I got no regrets from that for doing that. I called for a boycott of the Olympics this year after this ridiculous ceremony. But for me, that wasn't even wasn't even a challenge. I haven't watched the Olympics in years. It's all fake and gay, gay and woke, isn't it? <laughs> for a long time, they wreck it. They wreck everything. They've wrecked sports a long time ago, right? So no, I'm sorry. I, I don't give a flying fig about the Olympics and their drag queen torch bearing freak show. You know, I, I just couldn't care any less about that. Look at look at look at this. Right? This is how it started. This is how they decided to lead. Just offending everyone, crushing every God-fearing, Christian, family-oriented person in the stands. Just, who cares? Go to hell. This is what we stand for. And we're like, oh yeah, but it's the Olympics, and I want to see what, I want to see who has the most gold medals. We got to stop that, right? We got to take a stand against that as Christians. You, th <laughs> you think... You think the early Christians were clamoring out of the catacombs and running in, taking in the show at the Colosseum on a Friday night? No, at some point they're like, okay, we have this part of the pie, and they have all the rest of it, and the two don't necessarily intersect, okay? We're going to live separately. That's how they did that, and out of that came the greatest, the most glorious civilization that man has ever seen in Christendom, because they separated themselves from the insanity Time for us to do that, isn't it? And where, by the way, I touched on this earlier on in the show, where, where, was the, where was the vicar of Christ, Pope Humble I? Where was the vicar of Christ in the face of this brutal, sadistic, sick mockery of the person of Christ? Where was, where was Francis? This was a, a sacrilegious, blasphemous mockery of Christ, mockery of the mass, Mockery of the Last Supper, where was Francis? Where has he been? He could still say something, right? As far as I know, he hasn't. <laughs> Not one word from Pope Humble I. Even after incredible things happened, for example, Paris, the city of lights, went dark the same night, your holiness. The entire city went black, went dark everywhere except for the Sacre Coeur, except for the Basilica Sacre Coeur, which was light, lit up like a candle in the darkness, the Basilica of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. How do people look at that and just go, huh, honey, what's for dinner? How do you continue to function when you see signs like that? The mighty Paris goes dark just days after Pride Month ended, just, just hours after the Gay Pride Olympics opening ceremony detonated all over the world. Months after Pope Francis had incredibly had called for the blessing of homosexual unions throughout the world, right? Paris goes dark and the sacred heart of Jesus lights up. This was so dramatic that bishops all over the world found their tongues. Bishops, Catholic bishops including some really good ones like Cardinal Raymond Burke, who called the whole thing, the opening ceremony, he called it unbelie an unbelievable manifestation of the darkness and sin in our world. He called it an abominable mockery of the Holy Eucharist. Absolutely, your eminence. God bless you. Maybe, maybe tweet that over to Francis as a little reminder. You know, this was so egregious. There's no wonder that, that, in, that in the wake of what he called the blasphemous and debauched opening ceremonies of the Olympics, Bishop Joseph Strickland weighs in. He tweets that this is the evil on display, mocking God's power, and then the city is left powerless. He's talking about Paris. May the sacred heart of Jesus, says Bishop Strickland, may the sacred heart of Jesus guide us in his powerful light. And people are waking up everywhere, not just in the church. Thank God, princes of the church are waking up. But princes of the state are waking up too. Right? The, 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 I guess you would call him the rightful heir to the French throne, Louis de Bourbon, roared out his protests over this Olympic Games in his beloved France. You know what he said? Quote, to all the French people 
who have felt humiliated and scorned by the Olympic blasphemy. Our country is under increasing attack from this profoundly unnatural and destructive ideology. So with every passing day, it is up to us French to choose the model we want for France. We must rebuild our beloved homeland and build a solid, credible future anchored in tradition, respect, and union. May St. Louis protect France. <laughs> Somebody's ticked off. Somebody's had enough. And here, by the way, is Louis de Bourbon with Cardinal Gerhard Muller, no less, <laughs> at this year's Sharp Pilgrimage. You see, the clans are coming together, friends. They're uniting. What did I tell you? I've been telling you all along. People have had enough. Don't think that your voice doesn't matter. Get out there and shout. Go climb a mountain. Do whatever you possibly can to raise awareness that you have had enough, that your tribe has had enough, that your people, your children, your parents, your grandparents have had enough, and it becomes contagious, doesn't it? People have had enough of Francis, the globalist, fiddling while the world burns, fiddling while our children burn, and you don't have to be a Catholic to be burned up inside over what they're doing to children. Here's Elon Musk. It's child mutilation and sterilization. Yeah. Yeah. Under the guise of gender affirming care and compassion. Right, right. I can't, I, it's, it's I evil. literally I can't imagine evil. anything worse than that. Yes, it's evil. It happened to one of my older boys where I was, I was essentially tricked into signing documents for one of my older boys, Xavier. This is before I had really any understanding of what was going on, and we had COVID going on, and there was a lot of confusion. And I was told, oh, he, Xavier might commit suicide. If he... That was a lie right from the outset. It's incredibly evil, and I agree with you that people that have been promoting this should go to prison. Okay, so I see. So that's So I was I went into doing this, um, and it wasn't explained to me that puberty blockers are it's actually just sterilization drugs. Anyway, and I lost my son, essentially. They, they call it dead naming for a reason. Yeah, I... All right, I'm, so they, the reason it's called dead naming is because your son is dead. So my son Xavier is dead, killed by the woke mind virus. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. I can't imagine what that would be like. Yeah. So yeah. I vowed to destroy the, mind, the woke mind virus after that, and we're making some progress. Join the club. Yeah. And now, of course, we're going to have ourselves a brand new president. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. This weird little ventriloquist dolly <laughs> who wants more of the same, by the way, what Musk is talking about. She wants more of that everywhere, not just for kids, not just in schools, but even, <laughs> even in prison. And there was a specific case. And when I learned about the case, I worked behind the scenes to not only make sure that that transgender woman got the services she was deserving. So it wasn't only about that case. I made sure that they changed the policy in the state of California so that every transgender inmate in the prison system would have access to the medical care. What do you do with it? I mean, right? Caligula style insanity, right? That's, that's, here, there's, there's your next president. You, you, you think she can't win? <laughs> really? Well, she's neck and neck in the polls already. Isn't that a weird coincidence? They're always so close, aren't they? This total empty suited nut job is suddenly neck and neck in the polls. Oh boy, oh boy, 47, 48. We're gonna track this for the next three months, aren't we? Friends, it's all fake and gay. You know that, right? And don't for one second think they're not going to prop her up to win. Do you believe there's anything serious going on here? Don't you understand what the voting process has become in this country? Largely, the voting box where you put your little ballot, that is the suggestion box for the slaves. That's all it is. It doesn't matter. And that's exactly what they want you to think, by the way. Oh, man, Trump's going to kick her, boy. Uh, he's got this a slam dunk. Really? It took a couple days for that to begin to fade away. Of course she can win. You think you just fell out of a coconut tree? <laughs> Cami Harris is the next current thing that the blue-haired freaks called the American people with everything pierced and tatted, those people that have not had an original thought in their head in years, who have not read a nonfiction book since The Hunger Games. Those folks, they look at Cami Harris and they see the future. You're welcome. <laughs> Cammy's brilliant. She's a media creation. 
She is Ukraine. She is vaccines. She is Israel all wound up in, in one big new current thing. <laughs> all she has to do to beat Donald Trump, all Cammie has to do is distinguish herself as the most bloodthirsty baby killer in U.S. history. And she wins. One in three women of reproductive age in America lives in a state with a Trump abortion ban. So what we need to do is vote, because I'm going to tell you something. When I am president of the United States, I will sign into law the protections for reproductive freedom. So let's get this done. Now, we do, we do, we've done shows on this, friends. This is no longer politics. Right? This is all about baby killing. This is all about ritualistic sacrifice. It's all about the blood sacrifice. It's about a demonic anti-sacrament called abortion, isn't it? That's what drives all of this. We're not the single issue ones. They are, right? That's all they campaign on now. Killing babies, spilling blood, killing grandmothers, castrating children, right? This is a religion. It's gotten so bad now. It's gotten so obvious that this is a spiritual war. That even, even the Donald is out there warning that, that, that you know what Cammie's really after, he said? You know what she's really after? She's actually going after Catholicism. Even Donald Trump can see it. As a senator, she viciously attacked highly qualified judicial nominees simply because they were members of the Knights of Columbus, suggesting that their Catholic faith disqualified them from serving on the federal bench. And I'll tell you something. I don't know how a Catholic can vote for the Democrats because they're after the Catholics. Almost as much as they're after me, I would say I top you, I'm proud to admit. <laughs> but they're really after the Catholics. Where's Francis's warning about this attack on Catholics, on the Catholic Church in America, what's left of it? Where's his warning? <laughs> and meanwhile, the liturgical Madness under regime Francis reaches positively black mass proportions now. I mean, think about this. Team Francis banned the Latin mass, most recently, banned the Latin mass in the Cathedral of Our Lady of Covendonga in Spain for the Our Lady of Christendom pilgrimage, which just ended, right? They banned that mass while this was happening also in Spain. Any questions? That's what they're doing to the mass. That's the mass that evidently Team Francis wants us all intimately united with. There's a show of unity in the world. That's why we need to get rid of the Latin mass, you know? And you know what? I'm gonna close on this. On that mountain in Africa, it all became so crystal clear after all the noise, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, everything gone, not even possible. It's just you, yourself, and you, right? On a mountain, climbing up towards the heavens, you know, it comes really, really, really clear. And it became clear to me. All you need, especially as it got cold, as it got dark, as it got more dangerous, all we need to do is hang on. All we need to do, even at 19,000 feet in the middle of the night, right? Put yourself in God's hands. That's it. Sound like a cliche? It shouldn't, because that's exactly what we should do. Do your duty before God and your family, right? And it, it, this will take care of itself. Prepare to keep the faith in the clandestine underground churches, like the ones all over Africa that I just visited. I know, I was there. I was spending time with them. No, I'm not going to identify them. Please don't ask me to, because these people are beautiful. These people are changing lives, you know. I visited their classrooms. These classrooms are filled with children. The only thing I could think of is my own. I was like the last generation of people that went to normal Catholic schools. I was fortunate to have access to the nuns. And all I could think of was the old Catholic class classrooms of the past. These kids, so many of them, well-spoken, polite, standing up, speaking to people, looking you in the eye, learning the old faith, being educated in the classical education, right? Right now, even the little kids in Africa seem to be on a mission from God. Here's an example. As soon as the bell would ring, the, the bell, by the way, in one, in one of these places that we went, a boarding school, 
was an old car tire with a board through it and on two wooden sawhorses and a little guy's out there with a tire iron beating on the bell. And when the bell rings, right, the classroom's empty out and these kids are so normal and cute and so wonderful and full of life and happy that it was just absolute joy uh, to see this. And at the same time, the nuns, nuns all over the place, so many nuns. The nuns, the traditional habited nuns are back in Africa. I felt again, I felt like I was back in grade school in the 1970s. So many young women who want to become brides of Christ, you know? And then so many strong young men, the future, the future priest for us all, the future of the Catholic Church is in Africa. I just met them, <laughs> hundreds of them. And this is just in a couple of different places in Tanzania, not throughout all of Africa, just Tanzania. It's the only place I was. You know, while, while I was at, in Africa, I received invitations to speak in Kenya, Nigeria, Nairobi, places that, places that don't even know where they are, you know? But you know what, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it because we all need to get behind this effort. This is it. This is the most important Unite the Clans effort in the world. This is the future. And, by the way, what we saw there is so incredible. We saw not only classrooms, not only um, boarding schools for little kids, for orphans, like orphanages, we also saw hospitals. We saw places where they're taking care of the poor. The, the, the corporal works of mercy are being addressed in spectacular fashion in Africa. So once we have this foundation set up, you will be able to, I will be able to contribute and do our part with the corporal works of mercy in Africa simply by contributing and letting these people who are experts at what they do, I just found out because I got to meet them all, let them do what they do best. This has got a lot, a, a really promising future for all of us to be able to be involved with this. So I would say again, carry on. <laughs> you know, if you wanna be obstinate, uh, you loose knit tribes of warring American traditionalists, go right ahead, carry on with my blessing. Couldn't care any less because what we're doing is we're looking in a different direction. We're looking to Africa where real things are going on. People aren't just talking about it. People are actually doing it. You know, I got to, to know these people. I talked with the Africans. I ate with them. I prayed with them. I went to mass with them. And although they all speak either their own tribe's language or Swahili, I got to worship God with them in one voice, una voce, right? So again, this was the old lesson that was say, so you go anywhere in the world and you'll be able to be completely unified with people going to, the, going to the Catholic Mass. Or, well, that happened to me just a few days ago. Just a few days, I got up early, sun hadn't even risen up over Kilimanjaro yet, went to Mass. This was the scene. Beautiful things happen, like when we left finally, on the last night when we left Africa, we're gonna leave the next morning. Uh, a bunch of these students, some of them were, were uh, novices for the, with, the, with the sisters. All of a sudden we were talking inside this little parlor to some of the priests and I was aware of a kind of a commotion outside so I peeked out through the, through the blinds. There's mosquitoes all over the place, you know, you know, we're talking about malaria and all that. Peek out through the blind and there's this line of young women who had come out to say good night. If you can hear this, this little clip, they're saying, God bless you, thank you for coming, safe journey, and then they keep saying over and over again, we will love you forever. Take a listen. There's your hope, friends. There's, there's the hope for the whole world and for the future. It's in Africa. You know what, standing in a doorway, thousands of miles from home, my eyes were filled with tears when these little joyful brides of Christ, these little happy souls, childlike warriors, if you will, 
stopped by to say goodnight to Our Lady before they went to bed. They didn't know I was there. They were just running through on their way to bed. And that's the love that they have for, the lady, for Our Lady. And this is just the beginning, friends. Honestly, let me close on this. I have found the source of hope for the whole world. I'm absolutely convinced. I now understand why it is that Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre loved the Africans so much and had so much hope for the future of the church based on what he had done and what he had seen in Africa. Having just returned from Africa myself now, I understand that. And I understand a lot of things I didn't understand before. God wins in the end. And right now, he's marshalling his children of light all over the world, and especially in Africa.